picture, is it? Well, close. Close enough. Yeah. Oh, well, big drop there. Jim, you must have cut, cut, caught up for me. I didn't admit that last person. Okay, it's about that time. Uh, Janet is uh, just barely in under the wire. So I'm going to go ahead and, and get started for those of you who don't. I'm Dick Wilkin, I'm your president as of January, and the, uh, the new responsibilities. I'd like to welcome everybody today to our second general member meeting. Uh, I, I know that from looking at the names of people that are signing in that we've got some, some new attendees from Zoom and that's great to see. Um, I'd like to make a few comments as we get going. Um, this is our second Zoom meeting. Our first meeting was uh, last month. We and you should know that we we posted it online. We now have uh, we now have the capabilities. Uh, we have our own channel uh, on, uh, on. You can go directly to the web. Go to YouTube. Put in CSDREA, and you can bring it up. We are recording and you can play back the general member meetings. You can, you can fast forward, you can skip through the general member portion of it and watch the presentation. Uh, you can also find that uh, on our minutes on our website as well. Um, I did want to mention many of you know uh, Joe Flynn and I'm sad to report that his wife Gloria has passed this just a few days ago. He did let us know and for those of you who are not Joe, he is someone that is goes way back with with the city uh, as an employee, a retiree. He's been very active for many years in REA, has been on our board in the past. He has been an elected board member for SERS. He's done a lot of uh, work for us and we all really appreciate him and we're sorry that his, his wife has passed. She uh, had cancer for the last couple of years. And, um, recently passed after two years, but she was in hospice care and got really great care. And, and so I just wanted to mention to our membership that, that Joe was in that situation. So please, uh, we, we, we certainly as a board put, pass along our condolences to him and his family. Um, since our last meeting, one of the things I think we put in our newsletter, but I want to acknowledge it as well. Um, uh, it's it, obviously the pandemic is, is terrible and, and we're really struggling as a country and as, as a state and, as, and, and not so much as a community, but it's been rough. But one of the things we've enjoyed, uh, we being REA have enjoyed is, is from summer in June and July, adding 72 new members. Um, every year we serves as, has been very cooperative and good to us and has allowed uh, us to, uh, when they send out their packet of information for their health insurance um, sign up sheet in June, they've allowed us to include a brochure and, and flyers and applications. And, and we really rely on this to help us recruit new members. And this year we, we got 72 new members out of the efforts that so were really pleased with that. That's, that's really great. Speaking of uh, SIRS, I, I'd like to welcome um, Greg Rademacher, who is the CEO, who always joins us, uh, and who is going to fill in today for Cynthia Queen, who couldn't. Um, the reason you see my finger is I'm letting in people as they. Uh, I can also want to welcome. I'll do that. Also want to welcome um, Marcel Rossman, who is the deputy CEO for. for, for they're, they're both able to attend, and we really appreciate all their support. We, uh, in terms of our minutes, at our, when, when we had in-person meetings, we, we would ask for motions and seconds, but because we're doing this virtually, we, we're skipping that part, but the minutes of the last general member meeting are posted on our website. 
and you can review them there. If you have any suggestions or comments, just drop us a, an email and, and we'll acknowledge that. Um, secondly, our, our treasurer's report, treasurer's reports, uh, we generally um, have them available. We don't approve them, but what we do as a board is we accept them. And the board of di this morning did accept our treasurer's report, uh, which is done by Karen Butler, our great treasurer. Uh, we, in our general member in-person meetings, we have them available uh, at the back of the room for pickup, but obviously we don't have a room for you to pick them up. So if you want to get a copy, just uh, email Karen at her uh, REA address, and she will be happy to send you a copy of the July Treasury Report. Okay, at this point, I'd like to introduce Gray Bottomaker, who's again the CEO of, of SERS. And uh, Gray, could you give us a SERS report, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dick. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to join your REA general meeting today. Uh, SD SERS is alive and well. Uh, our pandemic staffing plan is delivering the retirement benefits accurately and timely. So I'm very, very pleased that we're paying the retiree payroll every month, each month on time. So things are good and things are looking up. Our long-term investment portfolio is well diversified and ready, willing and able to deliver your retirement benefits uh, in full and on time. Um, and I would like to also thank you for your patience as we improve our call center availability. Uh, we are very close to further expanding our call center hours through our remote call center. Uh, we are also working on our annual membership meeting. You may recall that traditionally, we hold an in-person meeting at Balboa Park each fall, where the SD SERS leadership team provides an organizational update on how things are going and what's on the horizon. But due to COVID-19 and our desire to help you stay healthy, um, our in-person meeting will be replaced by a video on the SD SERS website. So we're just in the process of creating that and making that, but uh, a little bit later this year, we'll have our annual membership meeting available online. Um, just really want to reemphasize SD SERS values our partnership with REA. And we really enjoy working with your new president, Dick, and your leadership team, because I really believe that working together, we can get through anything, and, I, and we will. So thank you. That concludes my SD SERS update. Thank you, Greg. And I'd like to echo what you said, that we've really enjoyed a good working relationship with SERS for quite a while, and uh, we've had great relationships since you've come on board, your management team, uh, both you and Marcel, and Cynthia is doing an outstanding job as a membership services director. Um, we've had, from time to time, we'll get um, a, a call, I will get a call, or one of our board members might be with some issues, and we, we've tried to productively uh, help resolve some issues between people in your, your organization, and you know, this, those have always gone well and gone smoothly, and we really appreciate that. We appreciate your attendance at our meetings and your interest in our, and we really do consider it a partnership. So thank you for the ongoing great working relationship, and things are, seem to be going really, really well at SERS with the board and with the staff, and, and we thank you for that. Um, at this point, uh, I'd like to give you a, a bit of a briefing on something that's occurred at the California Supreme Court recently. Uh, one of the functions, uh, normally Chris Brewster, who is a board member, who is our kind of our legal expert, if you will, on these matters, he, he is also, I might add, um, a, um, the, the moderator for what we call the uh, retirement roundtable, which is something that we have retired fire and police started a few years ago. It's a, a meeting where we get people from other retiree organizations all over the state, um, state uh, level, other county level, um, 
military, um, federal retirees. We, we meet twice a year in San Diego. Um, and the purpose for that is to share information, to keep an eye on legal threats that may be, we may be seeing growing in the future. We share information about how we can better communicate with our, our, our public and our interests. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that we've been following is the court cases related to what's called the California rule. Um, California rule is a, a series of court decisions that have gone back to the 1950s uh, in, in the state. And, and uh, these rules, these, or what called a rule, it's just a series of court decisions over the years, Supreme Court decisions. And what they have basically held is that um, once you're, you join a public organization in California with a, that has a defined benefit pension, um, the, those, those benefits that you, you get on your first day of employment are what you need to get when you retire. So um, there can be changes to your benefits, uh, but if there are things that, because things change that they're taken away, then they typically have to replace them with something of comparable value. Well, that, that is, in recent years, that, that finding has come under attack. Um, uh, people that are not in favor of defined benefit pensions in the public sector uh, would like to be able to, um, on a going forward basis, reduce your benefits. So in other words, when I say going forward, I'm really talking about from here on. In other words, what you've earned up to now, you're vested in those and those can't change. If I'm not retired yet, and, and I, they would like to be able to, to uh, modify those on a going forward basis. So there have been some a series of uh, challenges to that. Uh, there was one recently, what's called the Alameda County one. And that was a situation where um, we were not, the uh, city of San Diego was not involved, but a number of years ago, the state of California um, passed a law which curtailed some of the additional benefits um, related to retirement benefits for what are called the 1937 Act counties. It, these were things like uh, being able to uh, use vacation leave uh, at, when you retire, uh, overtime, so on and so forth. And in your final year, if you if you could use that to increase your your last year of your salary, what you made in that last year, then that could help you bump up your eventual retirement or your bed your base. Um, that the legislation that was passed it didn't affect Diego, but it did affect other agencies and basically was an attempt to rein in what's called spiking, which is that what I just described, which is that you know you may use uh, vacation benefits of uh, working overtime, uh, getting a, a promotion in last year and so forth to raise that last minute. So they outlawed, they basically had outlawed the, the ability to do that kind of spiking, which seems reasonable, but there have been some lawsuits that have attempted to uh, say that violates that California rule, rule that I just described. Um, this is, this, the Alameda County one wound this way up to the Supreme Court of California and basically, um, uh, some people were concerned that the Supreme Court may use opportunity to uh, do away with the, or modify the California rule, but instead what the court decided to do was to say that, that the, uh, legis the, the doing away with spiking and eliminating those was actually in harmony with the California rule, that it was basically attempting to end practices that could jeopardize the stability of what was guaranteed by the California rule. So they basically decided that it, what the legislature did to eliminate spiking was appropriate and was in harmony with the California rule and did not in any way attempt to overturn or modify that basic understanding. Um, 
So that, that was the long and the short of it. We expect that there, 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 there's still one other case pending, but I think our expectation is that uh, at this point, the California rule is, it looks like it's going to remain intact. In um, again, our, my reason for briefing you is that one of the things that we do as an organization is to keep an eye on those kinds of things. To, uh, and, you know, um, if necessary, uh, take, take appropriate action, but we haven't had a need to do that. Okay. Um, I don't think Mike is here yet. Um, Jim, are you online yet at this point? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Could I take a minute to um, remind everybody that the session is being recorded? So look nice. Uh, also, everyone is uh, currently muted, and that's to uh, reduce the background noise and issues. And if you have a question or need to speak, uh, one way is to wave your hand and hope we see you on video or use the chat function uh, that's available by Zoom. Uh, those folks on the phone, I'm not sure what you're gonna do other than shout as loud as you can and hope you get your attention. Uh, Dick will be in charge of uh, who uh, gets to speak. And when Mike gets here, uh, Michael Zucat apparently is not online yet. We expect him at 11.30. So Dick is free to uh, uh, do whatever he wants now. We could do the flag salute. Everybody stand. Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Dick. Uh, Jim, if you, if you could uh, try to get in touch with uh, Mike and get, get him online and just let me know if you get him. I do want to ask, uh, Dave, are you there? Yeah. Um, why don't you update, while we're waiting to get Jim online, why don't you update the, uh, the membership on the image enhancement project, where we're at with that. Okay, sure. Uh, as you know, uh, several months ago, your board adopted a, uh, a program, a trial program, uh, for the remainder of this year to reach out to the community uh, to find ways to improve the image of city retirees. And the goal of that is uh, primarily to make yourself known to the community so that uh, when issues come up uh, that relate to your benefits uh, that are to be decided by the voters, um, it isn't an automatic no, uh, that people will at least consider it. Uh, and, and also a secondary and, and equally important purpose is to put ourselves more uh, in, in focus with the city council. Uh, it's not always the best situation that the only time they see us is when we have a problem. Uh, we'd like to show that we're out there in their districts doing good things. Uh, that effort has been curbed somewhat by COVID and uh, some of the, the programs that we had hoped to do, uh, one was uh, to celebrate National Reading Day with grades K through three at the Monarch School in San Diego. This is the school for children who are homeless. Uh, that was going to happen in January. Of course, no the schools are not in session or will not be in session. Uh, it doesn't look like. So that's kind of on hold. Our second outreach was to uh, a, a foundation called Prevent Drowning. Uh, <laughs> drowning is, a, is a, a very preventable problem, uh, particularly in communities where kids don't have the, the uh, opportunity uh, to learn to swim. Uh, 
and this is to help provide for that. That too is on hold so, because the pools are closed. But there are things that are moving forward. I do want to mention to you the primary, primary one is we have entered into a partnership with Voice of San Diego. If you're familiar with Voice of San Diego, it is a independent media outlet. Uh, it's one of its main uh, products is a Monday through Friday online uh, column called the Morning Report. It reaches 25,000 people and beginning in September, and I will be uh, publishing the, the specific dates, but beginning in September, by virtue of our agreement with Voice of San Diego, we will have the opportunity to have our REA banner as a sponsor at the top of that page, and perhaps with a footer with our logo uh, in support of fact-based journalism. This is a, a real big step forward for REA. It uh, gives us a, a friend, not that they're going to be swayed in their reporting on uh, retiree issues, but gives us a friend in the media and an opportunity for us to, uh, to present ourselves. So that's the, the, that's the main thing that's going on right now. You'll start to see those banners, that appearance on Morning Report in September, uh, growing more frequently uh, as, it, as we approach the uh, presidential election. Uh, when we'll be on for five weeks, we'll be on two days a week. So check out Voice of San Diego. Also, you, was, you will remember from your uh, the last newsletter and online, this is the month where Voice of San Diego does its annual membership drive. And they're reaching out to REA, uh, consistent with our, our partnership with them, to try to encourage people to support Voice of San Diego. It's $35 a year. Uh, very, very well worth it. It is really, truly unbiased journalism. So that's, uh, that's up and running. Uh, that's about it, Dick. Thank you very much, and I'm glad you reminded me, Dave, to about about the VOSD Voice of San Diego issue. I, I too have been a long time member of Voice of San Diego. I think I go back to the first few months of their existence, five or so, uh, and I would encourage our members if they haven't joined to join. Uh, as Dave said, it's only $35 a year. Uh, it's great to have uh, them around. Uh, they don't attempt to be a, a newspaper to cover everything. They, they attempt to focus on local issues and, and do independent journalism, focusing on local government, uh, a lot of focus lately on school issues and so forth, uh, and have really earned a reputation as objective, uh, in-depth, investigative reporting. Um, and so our partnership is something that we're really looking forward to. It, it, it gives them hopefully exposure to our people and hopefully some new membership for them. It gives us exposure, as Dave said, uh, to people that read the Voice Morning Report Voice of San Diego Morning Reports, as we're going to have our, our logo and our banner right on the top of those on selective days. And again, our whole, uh, the whole objective of our image awareness campaign is to, um, as Dave said, make people aware that as retirees, we're not just collecting our paychecks, but we're actually giving back and being productive in the, or in the community. And as an organization, it increases the people's awareness of us and our purpose. And we hope that that will increase our clout as we try to influence things. Uh, and, and so it's a win-win for everybody. And so I would, I would really encourage people to, um, uh, to join Voice of San Diego. And I want to thank
for uh, uh, Mike is here. This is great. I want to thank Dave for as the vice in terms of uh, programs. He's he's really initiated this and together and done a great job. And we want to thank Dave for that. Um, okay, Mark, are you on? You on? Are you online, Mike? You're not quite there yet. I'm here. Okay, Mike. Um, we're just ready for you. I, I, I'm one entered, I'm going to close our regular meeting at this point and uh, uh, introduce Mike Zuckett. And he is someone that you know that old cliche of someone that doesn't need introduction. He, the epitome of someone that doesn't need an introduction for our our membership. And he's someone that. Uh, is doing a great, did a great job when he was on the city council. They, they, he's done a great job as the general manager of MEA. And in the last few years, I'm sure you all, all of our members know that we, we've become good partner organizations. Um, and we, we support each other and, and, uh, we really enjoyed a very close working relationship. And Mike has a lot to do with that. So at this point, I'd like to introduce, uh, Mike Zuket and uh, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Dick. I really appreciate the kind introduction, and hello, everybody. Nice to see you all again. I'm sorry it's not at the at Balboa Park in January like normal, but, yep, and that's my dog, Bruno. So, um, sorry about that. Hopefully, the UPS truck goes away soon. Anyway, um, As Dick said, uh, and I want to return the um, and reiterate what he said, I've, it's really been great, the working relationship that MEA and REA have had over the last several years, and that's a credit uh, to the leadership of REA and uh, Dick and Jim and everybody for the communication, which has been great, and we found some uh, great areas to work together on, and obviously we're very aligned in um, in our in our interests and our and our backgrounds, and so that's all been great. Um, I want to save uh, as much time as possible for questions and and uh, talk about whatever uh, you all would like to talk about. I guess I just wanted to give you a little bit of a of a uh, of a of a window into what's been going on at the city since since COVID started. Uh, in mid-March, we were three months deep into contract negotiations. As I think everybody's painfully aware, the you know the city underpays its employees relative to other jurisdictions in the county. Uh, we're the only uh, city in the state of California that doesn't offer a defined benefit pension to new hires, and those factors and others contributed to a significant recruitment and retention problem that has been going on for years, but uh, really, uh, you know, unfortunately took some time to get the attention of, of elected officials in the city um, and manifest itself into service issues. And um, all of that was uh, conspiring to make these contract negotiations uh, more productive than others. And we, you know, had a, well, <laughs> I would say I would offer my opinion that we were going to end up with a two-year uh, deal with the city that would include not just cost of living adjustments, but, you know, a, um, a move to, to cut into the, to the, to the disparity uh, with other jurisdictions, as well as a number of special salary increases that were overdue in certain classifications that were particularly hemorrhaging employees. So all of that was what was going on in about mid-March when the world stopped. And um, a month later, when we you know, got over the shock and the complete shutdown for a few weeks. Uh, the city was all of a sudden facing a 200 plus million dollar deficit. Uh, property tax, or pardon me, hotel taxes uh, in the month of April were zero. Uh, not not almost zero. Not 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 something. Not not very low, but zero. And for most of May, the same. Uh, you know, the city's revenues had. Uh, 
had blown up. So uh, that essentially upended uh, everything we had worked for over the previous months. And we were instead faced with fending off, uh, you know, uh, an, an illegal effort by the mayor's office to furlough 850 employees, which we successfully defeated. Uh, after challenging the mayor's office uh, on that. Um, then the budget, of course, how did they wanna balance that budget? They wanted to do it on employees' backs and cutting service levels and cutting uh, 400 uh, plus MEA represented positions and hundreds of others. Um, so it was, uh, we went from, you know, thinking that we were gonna, you know, hit a nice, uh, double, maybe even a triple for negotiations to uh, fighting for the lives of our employees. So uh, a month after that, after the federal government had uh, passed the uh, what's known as the CARES Act, which uh, uh, for the city of San Diego anyway, uh, caused the city to have an influx of a, about a quarter billion dollars. Uh, which effectively was used to offset those uh, revenue uh, losses and restore uh, most of the proposed uh, position cuts, or at least certainly those that would result in, in, a, in an actual person leaving the city. And by the end of it, we had, um, you know, settled for uh, a one-year contract where we made a little bit of lemonade out of lemon with respect to our flex benefits and uh, secured substantial increases for those covering their family and dependents, um, but had to hold over any uh, attempts for salary increases or special salary increases until next year. And in fact, now we're just a couple months away from starting the negotiation process all over again. And at the end of the day, not a single MEA represented employee uh, was laid off. So uh, given everything that's going on with this pandemic and the uh, you know, brutal and actual pain being, being visited on all kinds of people all around the world. Uh, city employees, you know, uh, have emerged, not that it's over, but, you know, you know, relatively unscathed in terms of, you know, compared to the way things were looking uh, several months ago. Um, so that's just been, uh, you know, an unexpected uh, Months to the job that MEA has been doing in March and April and May and June. Uh, now we get back to, um, you know, uh, nothing's normal still, but we're back to uh, what? Well, Prop B, uh, something I've been, <laughs> we've been talking about since 2011. Um, the litigation on Prop B, the so-called pension reform initiative that that we successfully challenged all the way up to the California Supreme Court, that litigation is continuing. There's actually a, a deposition tomorrow with Ann Smith uh, and other union attorneys deposing the, beginning to depose the actual ballot proponents. Uh, as you know, the California Supreme Court found that this was the city's initiative because of the actions of Mayor Sanders and therefore found that it violated state law and therefore, um, was illegal, illegally placed on the ballot. Uh, the ballot proponents, the the, the so-called signers of the initiative, uh, that would be April Bowling, T.J. Zane, and Stephen Williams, are still trying to say, no, 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 it was really us. And so that's going to be uh, further challenged. And for the first time, those three individuals are actually going to be deposed and uh, will be faced to answer questions under oath as to what as to what really is going on. But the, the, the point, without getting into the weeds on all that, the point is this last stage of the litigation, the so-called uh, invalidation phase, at least that's our goal. And that's the path that the California Supreme Court set out when it, when it made its decision. Uh, it, we're in that last phase, um, but it's litigation uh, the civil courts, you know, shut down there for literally shut down for three months. And now everything is significantly delayed. Um, you know, depositions are still happening. Motions haven't even been filed yet in this final phase. Uh, the, the loser of this phase, which we uh, assume will be the ballot proponents have the right to appeal to the back to the fourth district court of appeal. So 
unfortunately, we're still a year or two um, at least away from a final court resolution as long as these ballot proponents keep fighting. The city, of course, has reversed course and has joined us asking the court to invalidate Prop B based on what the California Supreme Court said. If the ballot proponents did that tomorrow, then this would be over tomorrow. But as long as, as, long as somebody is paying their legal fees uh, to continue this fight uh, against uh, what seems like a, a clear ultimate outcome, given what the California Supreme Court said, um, we're going to keep doing that. And uh, so that beat goes on. Ann Smith is still kicking ass and uh, being Ann Smith, and uh, that doesn't change pandemic or not. So uh, so we're still doing that. So uh, with that, uh, Dick, uh, I'll stop babbling and um, be happy to talk more about that or anything else. I don't know how you want to handle uh, questions or you help, you help guide me. Okay, well, we're going to, uh, again, if you, I can now see nine people and one of those is me. <laughs> so, so if, if what I would suggest in terms of questions, if you kind of go like this, you want to ask it, and if either Jim or I, Jim, are you on online? Why don't you get get your mic going, Jim, because uh, you can help in this. I sure will, no problem. Okay, and so uh, let us know if, you, if nobody sees your way, uh, and you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute and, and, and speak up and we'll just try to, we'll, we'll try to monitor this. Let's all talk at once. Let me, let me ask uh, Mike, until um, we're waiting for some of our members, uh, what you see ahead in terms of um, the fact that there doesn't seem to be any additional federal help coming from the uh, to the state and local governments and what is that going to mean uh for next year's budget situation at the, in san diego so yeah I, i'm i'm sure that um i'm sure that everybody on this uh call is um sick of non-scientists and non-doctors predicting what's going to happen next with the uh, with the virus which then would lead one to understand what's going to happen next with the economy and city finances and all that so I don't want to tread into that ground um, what I would say is you know you're right the, the the second round of stimulus which was supposed to include, or at least there was a discussion about including explicit money to state and local governments. Um, even if that doesn't go anywhere, which at the moment it's not going anywhere, what the federal government already did, um, I think shouldn't be underestimated, at least for the city of San Diego. Um, that was a very significant chunk of change and it, um, and it essentially accomplished the goal of, of bridging the city budget um, for the next uh, 12 months. And so um, if in 12 months the economic condition is, is worse uh, or the same, then there's going to be a lot more budget pain to come. Um, if on the other hand... Um, because of things related to uh, to COVID or 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 therapeutics or a vaccine, which then spurs economic activity and travel opening again and conventions happening again, that doesn't need to happen in the next couple of months. But if that happens in the next you know six to nine to twelve months, um, it is possible that um, because of that bridge that the federal government essentially gave the city to weather these 12 months without having to cut a quarter billion dollars from its budget because that's what we would have had to do um, if not for that lump sum uh, stimulus money from the federal government um, you know uh, it could have been a lot different so uh, what the future holds i don't know but essentially what's baked into the city's budget right now is that is that things don't get better anytime soon and so um 
And so if things do get better in the next six to nine months and, uh, and things return, I'm hopeful that next year's budget, long-winded answer to your short question, that next year's budget will be okay. I'm assuming that everybody, and when I say everybody, I mean whomever the new mayor is and new city council. And I guess I should have mentioned that in my opening too. That's another thing we're certainly focused on. Um, you know, that they're going to be cautious and that would make sense given the sort of unprecedented times we're all in. But um, just take property taxes for the, for the moment. As I think most of you know, property taxes make up, uh, is the largest single revenue source for the city's general fund. It makes up uh, or it provides almost, I think, just over 40% of general fund dollars. Um, the housing market, uh, you know, go figure, you know, just hit a record uh, last month. Property tax uh, collections are, are down just a little bit because of, because of people in distress. But the assessed valuation of property in San Diego has only gone up uh, since March. And so while you know, hotel, while there's still no conventions, no Comic Con, nobody's staying in it, or at least nobody to in the certainly the numbers they had been are staying in hotels. Property taxes are are doing just fine um, in San Diego. So there's so it's just a it's a weird it's a weird mix. Um, let me just mention politics real quick, just because um, we of course ha and we're not going to get deep into politics. Don't want to don't want to bring us down into all that. But you know we do have a an open seat for the mayor uh, when, but what is less um, headline-ish is that five of the nine city council seats are being vacated this year, either because people are termed, termed out of office or are running for other seats. So we're gonna have a majority brand new city council in December and a new mayor, which um, hasn't happened in my uh, recollection of, of, of 20 or 30 years, maybe, maybe others, Rec, you know, remember differently, uh, but so we have a major shift coming uh, politically, and a lot of these races are are um, are very competitive, and we're certainly very engaged in those. We've been saving our saving our pennies to spend in this election cycle because we sort of saw this coming a few years ago, and uh, that'll be another thing we'll be focused on in the next three months. Great. Okay, questions from the group. I have one. Go on. Hi, Mike. Hi, um, Joan. Hi. Did, does MEA end up uh, supporting a particular candidate for mayor, or how do you, and if so, who might that be? Um, before the primary, uh, in fact, last year we endorsed Todd Gloria for mayor, um, and um, so we're supporting Todd Gloria for mayor um, and uh, our council endorsements are Joe LaCava in district one, Stephen Whitburn in district three, Marnie Von Wilpert in district five, Raul Campillo in district seven and Kelvin Barrios in district nine. I would note that um, Marnie and Raul in districts five and seven are current city employees. They're both deputy city attorneys right now. So, uh, It'd be nice to have a few uh, city employees uh, as city council members uh, come December. There was a third city employee, a firefighter named Aaron Brennan, who, who ran in District 1 for, the, uh, for that seat, but he did not make it out of the primary. So nice to see city employees taking a shot at, uh, at governing our city. Speaking of uh, city employees, uh, you probably have a, certainly a better handle on how current employees are doing during this time, uh, especially those who have been disrupted in their work site or having to change. <coughs> Can you give us an idea of what's going on with city employees? Yeah, so, um, and I failed to mention that, you know, March, April, May timeframe, I was talking about the budget and the, and the uh, and negotiations, but to your point, Jim, I mean, just like I, I you know, most other people in the world, it was, it was a it's time of great uncertainty for city employees and uh, are they going back to work? Who gets to go back to work? Who gets to work from home? When is the city going to open up again? Um, why is that person being assigned there and that person gets to stay home? Um, and, you know, the, the mayor's office and all of us were, you know, dealing with something that obviously was unexpected. Um, but, you know, 
there was a lot of communication challenges early on. And so I, so I think uh, to answer your question, that's, um, that's been smoothed out and, and mellowed. And there's essentially an equilibrium that's been reached, but, you know, not to, not to be too negative, but, you know, before the pandemic, city employees were not doing well. Uh, morale uh, continued to, to drop. Um, vacancies continued to increase. So the employees that were left behind from people leaving the city were doing more work with less. Um, you know, the pay uh, situation is significant. Um, and, you know, people are working in really crappy buildings and the panacea that was 101 Ash Street, you know, has turned into a gigantic debacle and political football. And so all these people who, for instance, had been essentially evacuated from the executive complex because of the asbestos there that was being disturbed and, you know, they were going to move into 101 Ash Street. That was 2017. That was three years ago. And they were moved to, you know, trailers in Kearney Mesa and temporary office space here and there, shoved into, you know, makeshift uh, uh, leases and, and existing crevices of, of, of cab. And, you know, don't worry, it's all temporary. You'll be going to 101 Ash Street soon. Um, you know, city operations building, which is the sickest building this, the city owns, uh, you know, those employees were all just about to go. And now they ain't going anywhere and the future is uncertain at best about 101 Ash Street and it's become a big political football. So, you know, I guess I would just say you all retired at a good time because it's only <laughs> gone downhill since, since yeah. then, you know, um, we're hopeful and I'm, you know, and I'm being, I don't know, I guess I'm, I don't know what I'm being, I'm trying to be honest, but it's, it's sad. Um, uh, and there's exceptions to this, but as a group, you know, um, and especially given the, you know, lack of competitive uh, salary and benefits, um, there's a lot of city employees who, if they have a choice, uh, they, they work elsewhere. If there's people applying or interested in, uh, you know, want a career in public service, the city of San Diego is not on their top of the list uh, to apply to. And, th and that is really, um, you know, that's really starting to manifest and, and spiral because when people leave and they're not replaced, then things get worse for people who are left. Then they get more of a wandering eye as to what else is out there. And so that, that, um, that situation was really spiraling uh, through last year and to the beginning of this year. Again, the pandemic sort of puts all of that in perspective. And, um, and you know, people are, people are uh, you know, just surviving and dealing with it. But when the, as the pandemic continues to wane and as things get back to quote unquote normal, that underlying uh, sickness in the city's human capital and city government's treatment of that human capital and lack of investment in that human capital is going to continue to manifest. So um, that's my, another long-winded answer to your straightforward question, Jim. Thank you. Other questions? I'll make a brief comment, Mike, about the uh, 101 Ash Street, that, that whole affair. Uh, makes the city look so incompetent. <laughs> it's just really unfortunate. And, and I hadn't thought so much about the impacts of all the employees that were negatively impacted because they're in substandard or dangerous existing workspace. Uh, but uh, I, I'm just amazed that that whole thing came down the way it did. It just, it, it just defies common sense. But, uh, oh well. Well, other question? I got another question. Oh, wait. There's I had one. I guess. There's, so, Go ahead, well, Loretta Walker's had her hand up for quite a while, uh, as well as whoever's on Dora's iPad. Okay, I can't see everybody. So, Loretta, are you there? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak about um, the impact the protests have had on city employees, their morale, the safety, budget, that kind of thing? Um, 
Well, when the protests were at their height earlier in the summer, um, it had a huge impact um, on our uh, members in the police department and uh, dispatchers, both because of the jobs they were doing and because their workspace is located in downtown San Diego and that was constantly being uh, evacuated or, or, um, or reinforced. Uh, people at the downtown Central Library, the same, uh, or, or at CAB. Um, and, you know, there was some internal issues sort of like, you know, like the world out there in terms of um, people having different perspectives on, on what was going on. And sometimes that would bleed into the, into the workplace. And so, um, you know, that's, that was the, that was the immediate impacts while it was sort of happening. And then, uh, you know, I think the greatest, um, uh, impact, I would say, is, is with our members in the police department who are being affected by, uh, you know, calls for reform and actual reforms that, that are happening and, um, and they're going to be a part of and we're helping navigate that. Richard, Dick, you want to call on people or uh, Terry has his hand up? I can't see them, so help me out, Jim. Okay, Terry, I'm going to unmute you. Was it Terry or Harry? Is there a Harry out there? Is there a Terry? Or are you talking yes. to Harry? Harry. I'm sorry, Harry. Harry. Let's, uh, let's go with Harry because he seems to have his audio up, and then we'll go to T. Terry, okay? Okay. Yeah, I just had a quick question about, oh, hey, Terry. Um, hey, brother. I, uh, yeah, I had a question about uh, Prop B. When is that going to affect us? Um, uh, if you've retired already, uh, or what 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 uh, uh, year groups would that, would that still affect when it even you know whenever it gets over? Uh, I guess a year or two from now. Yeah. So so the litigation is only going to affect people who were hired after July twentieth, twenty twelve. Um, so. I don't believe it affects anybody in REA's organization. Um, okay. It only affects people hired after that date, which by the way, is uh, approximately half of the city's workforce now. So um, that's how much hiring and people leaving has been going on for the last eight years is that half of the current employees are gonna be affected by that ruling, uh, but, but not any retirees. I, All right, thank you. Sure. Uh, good question here. I want to, before I go to Terry, just point out, I'm a citizen of San Diego and I'm being affected by Prop B. Damn it. Let's get this fixed. Well, yes. I, I, I appreciate that. I was going to give that speech, but I didn't think I, I, I was going to, I was keeping it individual, but you're, I mean, we're all, we all care about the underlying, the underpinnings of that litigation and, and where that heads, but as a technical matter as to who it affects, yes. Okay. All right. Terry, go for it. Um, I'd like to say one thing, just a big thank you to board member Joan. Um, I got my letter from risk management about SPSP about a month ago after it was mailed for two months ago. Um, two phone calls and one email to risk management asking what the heck am I supposed to do? I got no response whatsoever. So when the email came out and Joan had her name on it, I uh, called her. She uh, set me up with the information I needed to do to get to uh, Wells Fargo and get my money transferred, which I have done now to my, uh, to my 401k. But I guess the question is not only just thank you to Joan, but is anybody working out there? Um, well, first of all, um, I, we, we need to thank a particular MEA member um, who received our member of the year award for picking up the phone and calling on this issue, which is what started this whole thing a few years ago and caused uh, 1,100 city employees to get a settlement like you just got. Um, and he asked a simple question about why the city treated its 457 contributions differently than its 401k contributions. And when he did that, he set off a, a, a 
set of questions that that made me wonder and i brought in ann smith and and then and then it was big trouble for the city and went through a bunch of records and they had you know they had improperly done something they had to go back so um so so you know this is it's it's it, it's a, a success story um and it's good news the implementation of it though was the cities and risk management and they had to go and get an irs approval to to do what they were doing and then and then risk management were the communicators on it um so terry i all i can say is um uh that's not the first time i've heard somebody say i've been calling them and not getting a response or not getting a satisfactory response so um you know i i, I hope they're working but like many other places in the city um you know they don't have the staffing to do what needs to be done day to day let alone something like this so we've been trying to help navigate any if, if any of you personally or if you know somebody who's still having trouble with that uh, give MEA a call and let us let us help you uh, navigate that with risk management. Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me add that uh, Joan McNamara, who is she volunteered to to work this area, and we really appreciate all she's done. I will also say that uh, <clears throat> when this all first started, when when the word got out that this was going on. Um, we did get some calls from people saying they would, would not get the, they were not getting their phone calls returned and so forth. And, um, I went and met with the risk management director and the deputy director uh, and let them know that we were getting these calls and what was going on. And I don't want to make excuses, but they were saying that our, they just weren't prepared to handle something of this magnitude, both the technology the telephone technology and the volume of things and then as it came or as it came about covid making people having to work from home and they said that they <clears throat> they pledged to work to improve the technology much as SERS has done uh, and i don't think they've done that accomplished that yet uh, and, and again i'm not making excuses because um, returning phone calls is kind of a basic kind of a thing uh, there, there's really no excuse for, for not returning a phone call. Um, but, and again, I, I appreciate Mike's offer to help our members with issues they have. Joan, if we have more members that want to contact her, her, she's willing to make calls and to provide some guidance as well. And that's one of the things that we hope we can continue to do. Other, other questions of Mike? I can't see but nine people, so. I see Jean, uh, is it Cullen? Culkin. Jean Culkin. Hi, Dick. <laughs> I have a couple questions for Mike. One is, what percentage of city employees are working remote, remotely currently? Uh, right now, there's about 2,000 city employees working remotely. So on a percentage term, that would be about 20%. Okay. And what are your thoughts on uh, Barbara Bree? One of the members just now sent a chat about her because she was the first one to get involved in question for a one ash. And, um, you know, I've seen her in person. I think she's done a good job, but I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. Why, why Todd Gloria would make a better candidate. Yeah. So, so we, we, enthusiastically supported Barbara Bree when she ran for council in 2016 and we think she's done a great job. Um, I don't have a single uh, remotely negative thing to say about her or her performance as a council member uh, in general or specifically on employee and MEA issues, uh, period. Um, this was one of those situations that where I would say the same thing about Todd Gloria. Um, Todd Gloria's experience with us is is longer. It goes back to a couple of terms on the city council, uh, interim mayor for six months, um, then up in Sacramento for a couple of terms. And so uh, it was definitely, you know, a friend versus friend race, let's put it that way. And, um, and we came down on the side of Todd Gloria because um, we, because 
you know, we have longer experience with him. Uh, we thought and still do think that he's going to do a great job. Um, and that uh, because he has literally been in the chair before uh, as interim mayor, and we have that experience with him, I think that was the main thing that tipped things in his scale. Um, and, uh, you know, we also think that he is um, well positioned uh, uh, to 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 run a strong race, which he did in the in the primary, and we think he will in the general. Again, that doesn't take anything away from Barbara. I have nothing, not a single bad thing to say about her. And in other circumstances, uh, she very well may have been uh, the choice. Uh, but under these circumstances, we had to go with somebody, and we went with Todd. Um, um, I, saw Karen, I saw Karen Butler had her hand up earlier. I'm not trying to meddle, but <laughs> I don't know. You're, you got to unmute, oh. Karen. Well, not okay. I'm not well. Anyway, it's Joan. Just real quick. Uh, quite a while ago, the the gentleman on Dora's iPad, who was on my second page, had been waving and wanting to ask a question. So I don't know if anyone has noticed him. Yes, and I was going to point out the gentleman on Dora's pad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Hello. Over and out. Speak up. We, okay. We can hear Listen. You. I'm really concerned about the, the, the cause of the um, C-19 um, and its effect on the, on the, on the city and our, on a, and our retirement. I've been retired since uh, 2001 and, uh, and you know, everything's been running smooth up until um, this, uh, this uh, pandemic has started. But what I'm concerned is, you know, the, the long term, this goes on. City of revenue will be down. Um, the cash flow is not going to be there. What I'm worried about is, uh, besides not getting our checks, you know, and somebody, you know, having to dip into it to support the city. Um, is that a reality? Or am I just, uh, you know, yeah, over, over, uh, overthinking? Well, first of all, you're not over anything. It's impossible to over anything during COVID. Where all of our, uh, all of our brains and lives are being turned upside down. So it's so it's not an unreasonable thought. But my opinion, which is just an opinion, is that it's not something you need to worry about. Uh, the SD SIRS uh, system is extremely well run it's extremely conservatively run which means um on the one hand um you know uh, the requirement for the city to pay more into that system exists which is you know is a strain on the city budget but in terms of the um in terms of the uh the foundation of the pension system it has become very strong um, also, you know, when the stock market crashed, which obviously has an effect on what the city might owe and could further strain things, you know, the stock market crash happened. Um, uh, I believe the low point of the S&P 500 was March 23rd. And since then, um, the stock market is actually higher than it was before the pandemic. And so in terms of, for instance, back in the housing crisis, when the when SD SIRS, you know, was reporting, you know, multi-billion dollar stock losses, um, you know, it did have a slightly below expectation year that just ended June 30th. But, mm. you know, for the first month and a half of this year, they're already up. And so, um, you know, the, the city has, has learned, I don't think there'll be a politician ever, but there certainly won't be a politician for another couple of decades who even considers the notion of not having a city pay its full required contribution uh, to the pension system. Uh -huh. And as long as that's happening, and as long as the pension system is, is competently and conservatively run, my personal opinion is, is you nor anybody else uh, has anything uh, to worry about along those lines. But I don't want to diminish the fact that, you know, we just had a, you know, 
a once in a century type event of a pandemic. So who knows what might happen next? But at the moment, um, uh, that's not something I would, I would let yourself lose any sleep over. Could we hear from uh, Greg? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Jim, and thank you, Mike. And I, I just oh. want to reemphasize what uh, Mike has been sharing is that the, uh, the city is legally obligated to pay, and they, in communication with us, have expressed every intention to do so into the future. They understand their obligation, their promises to their employees, and their responsibility to appropriately fund the, the retirement system. The good news is, is, as Mike pointed out, that we do have a really good long-term funding structure. Uh, we believe it is a sustainable plan. And we do go through significant analyses of our investment portfolio to stress test it. You know, will it survive um, market downturns? The highest bidder. And so, as you had mentioned that you had re retired in 2001, you know, SD SERS has uh, successfully survived the dot-com market decline, the yeah. 2008 uh, Great Recession, and yeah. we are well positioned to invest through this market cycle, the, the pandemic uh, yeah, market cycle. You know what, that, that 2008 downturn was, <clears throat> that was mostly big bucks that law were switching around. They were, you know, all the companies got bailed out on that. Um, all the CEOs got their share, and and uh, nothing went to the uh, to the to the poor guy, to the to the real working man, man, who who the who the rich are on their backs, you know, and. and like what's like what's going on today you know that's uh they, they they seem to think that they can function without the without the without the middle class but anyway i don't want to get into all of that stuff but what i what i what i'm really concerned is when things get tight and you got a you know you got a bag of money over there what's uh it's just going out to people that already have done their job and they're retiring. You feel like, you know, and, and it's easy to dip into that, like uh, the government does with the Social Security and and so on and so on. But so, uh, this, this is what I, you know, I maintain if, if this thing gets really, I'm always trying to be ahead of the game, but a lot of times, you know, I don't really um, get angry. There's nothing I can do about it. That's that's what's the main thing about it. You're retired. You don't feel like you're 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 a hands-on person. You're just kind of in the shadows, drawing money, and, and you, you you seem powerless. And that's, yeah, well, that's what the big thing is, you know. For, fortunately, there are protections in place, and there is no dipping into the retirement system. So the city or the port or the airport, the three uh, employers that we service, cannot use the pension plan to balance their budget. So there, there's protections in place. And I reassure you that we've got enough liquidity to be a long-term investor and to keep paying your retirement benefits to you and to your survivors as promised. So as, as Mr. Zuket had mentioned, we've got a good business plan and we're confident that we're gonna be able to fulfill the promises that were made by your employers. Thank you, it's been enlightening. And oh, I'd like you to uh, pass on, uh, if you see Joe Flynn, tell him uh, Joe Magania said hi. He used to be my neighbor. <laughs> okay, we'll do. Years and years ago. We'll do that. Okay, um, it's after 12. Um, we can keep going if we need to. Um, Got other questions, uh, or we can call it a day at this point. Uh, I think it's been a great question and answer system session. Greg, thank you for uh, pitching in and, and su supplementing what Mike said, and and I think uh, Mike has a good handle on it from uh, you know his his perspective. And Mike has stayed uh, up on the pension system and how it's run and so forth, and 
myself having been a board member for six years, uh, also know that the, the, the system is extremely well governed and conservatively governed and got a great management in place and uh, excellent protections. And the point that Mike was making is that given the history, uh, the political history, it's highly unlikely that there would be anybody attempting to, to underfund the system like what happened in the early 2000s and the late 90s. Uh, but Mike, is there anything else that you want to add before we, we sign off? No, I appreciate it, and I hope um, hope to see you all again in person someday. And nice to see familiar faces on here as normal. We got uh, call out to Candy Mitchell, who is uh, I think the most recent. Uh, well, maybe not the most recent retiree. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, Francine, there you are. I was looking for you earlier. I didn't see your name, but now I see you see you. Anyway, so Francine's definitely the most recent uh, convert from from active uh, active employment with the city to, to retirement employment, Candy, and other board members and friends on here. So nice to see you all. Nice and to see I, you. And thank, thank you, you for all the hard work that you and Ann have been doing. Appreciate that, Francine. Thank you. And I thank just Thank you, Mike. Thank you and thanks, Candy. And most of all, I just want to say I hope you all are well and stay well and take care of each other and take care of yourselves. And uh, don't take any shit from anybody, okay? <laughs> you got that, Mike. Mike. Okay. Thank you for a great presentation, Mike. And we all we always enjoy having you. And uh, we look forward to next year at this time getting you back up. Thanks Sounds again, good. Mike. Talk Sounds to you good. later. Okay. Thank you all of our members for a great meeting. I, I remember it will be posted on uh, YouTube. Uh, so uh, uh, your board is going to continue to push along and, and work work through this pandemic. And we're going to get bigger and better. And, and we're going to keep looking after you, our, our collective interests. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. We had something almost like 50 members join us. So it was, it was a great, great participation. And we really appreciate that. And we will see you all next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I just want to say hi to Shirley Hall. Shirley's done. Shirley has joined us by her telephone, so. Yeah. All right. She might have hung up. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hi everybody. Somebody just joined us and I don't know who it is, but we're just signing off. You were just a bit a bit late, so we're sorry we missed you. Jim, thank you for hosting. Did a great job. Thank you. I guess uh, somebody just signed on because they wanted to be here for lunch. <laughs> They can, uh, they can go back and watch us on YouTube. And... Uh, Dana Chapin, thanks for joining, but you missed us. We're all leaving. We just finished off. Uh, if you want to watch the meeting, it's going to be posted in a couple days, either through the website, on the newsletter, or somewhere on YouTube. Sorry, Dana. Okay, I'm shutting things down, folks. Goodbye. Okay. Thanks again all. Thanks, Jim.